evening, sir. Great, what's happening? Long time no see, stranger. I was gonna say, it's been, uh, Christine has spoken to you a number of times over the years. Um, I was told that I was banned from talking to you. Why, I'm what happened? No, I'm joking. What'd I do? <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. Yeah. I'm completely joking. Um, so, uh, I've actually, a lot I want to talk to you about, but the reason I get to talk to you today is uh, The Babysitter, which yeah. is coming out on Netflix. Yeah. Um, from what I understand, and I could be wrong, it was developed at New Line, or I guess talk a little bit about the development of this film and how it all came about. Well, I mean, it all starts with the script. We, we read the script written by a guy named Brian Duffield, who's an incredible new writer, who's got a great voice and he's very original, and we jumped all over it and we just wanted to get the movie made. And every time you get a movie made, it's a small miracle. So we partnered with our friends at New Line to produce the film. And the whole time we thought, well, maybe we'll go wide with this movie and maybe we won't, but we wanted it to be quirky and original. And in the end, the three entities, Wonderland and New Line and Netflix came together and we just thought it was a perfect fit for Netflix. So everybody was happy and away we went. And it just seems to fit, uh, you know, what they're doing with Stranger Things and just that sort of aesthetic and what the expectation is. And I think the movie's just a little bit too weird to go out on 3,000 screens. I don't know if that makes sense anymore. Well, the other thing is, and a lot of people don't realize, is your movie could cost literally $1 to make, but then it costs 30 to $50 million to market and get it into theaters. Precisely, precisely. And it's getting trickier and trickier to get people to go to the theater because we were just talking about, it's just a new day. I mean, I think when we were kids, the state of the art of filmmaking and storytelling, frankly, was probably the two hour medium. Godfather, Back to the Future, E.T., take your pick. And that seemed like the gold standard. It still is, it's still great, love The Revenant, love a great many films out there. But I think, dare I say, the finest storytelling today is happening in 10 one hour increments, you know, with The Crown, or for God's sakes, Game of Thrones, or there are too many to imagine. You and I were just talking about it. I watch a movie every night, but now it's not only a movie every night, it's also television shows and catching up. And I, I don't really make a distinction as a fan or as a storyteller between the two. I just love what I love and you know, you don't need to be rich anymore to have a big screen television on your wall and have reasonable surround sound and have a very, very agreeable experience. So it's just changing the manner in which people are ingesting great stories. And I think it's to our advantage as fans. Yeah, I actually think this is the year that I've noticed, I, I, I attribute one of the reasons why the box office is not at what it used to be this year because of many more older people finally understanding what Netflix is and streaming content and starting to use it. Because I think that there are still good movies out there, oh, yeah. but people are more comfortable the $10 a month and have it all on your home screen. I think that's fairly put. And I think that you just have to have an urgency for a cinematic experience. I mean, you and I will be the first ones in line to go see the new Star Wars picture, and you know, here comes Thor this weekend. And there's many reasons to go, and I even enjoy small films in a movie theater setting, but it's not necessarily urgent. It's not essential to be in that environment. And look, I'm a huge fan of Chris Nolan, and I love his passion to keep the theater experience alive, to keep film itself as a medium alive. And I don't ever want to see it go away, but I do think that it's in everybody's best interest to have absolute highest quality storytelling available to you every night. I mean, that was sort of the advent of home video that was to our advantage. I used to have to see all those movies at the art house, you know, when they'd play little two night stints like they do down here at the, at the New Beverly. And, you know, along came home video and I was able to watch every single Alfred Hitchcock picture and that was awesome. So it's always just evolving and changing and you roll with it and you do your best to keep focus on storytelling. But um, it's just interesting that the, the gold standard isn't necessarily the two hour film anymore. Maybe it's a 10 hour series. I defer to you. I'm curious, so jumping into Babysitter for a second, how was it, don't, when you were filming it, did you know it was gonna be on Netflix? Or was that after it bit wrapped? No, we, 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 we didn't really have a plan at that point. We wanted to see how the film came out and we just thought we'd run it up the flagpole because I'm very good friends with Sue Kroll who runs releasing out at Warner Brothers and Toby Emmerich who was running New Line at the time and now runs Warner Brothers itself. And of course, Kevin Sujihara. These are all my dear friends. So we talked about an intelligent plan and New Line was acting as the production company along with Wonderland. So we just wanted to see a rough cut of it and then decide what we wanted to do with it. And we cut a very agreeable deal for all, for all parties. And Netflix has been awesome. So it's a, it's a proper Netflix original. I mean, they didn't just buy a finished picture. They, they finished the picture with us. Uh, I've heard nothing but great things from all the people I know that have worked for Netflix saying that they give good notes that they leave creators like they're pretty hands-off you know um was that your experience 
it was indeed. I can't speak highly enough about Netflix. And look, they, they took a real chance with David Fincher and House of Cards all those years ago. And you know, guys like two of us were like, well, I hope that works. And it certainly did. So yeah. you know, uh, this guy, Matt Broadley, who is in charge of our film, is great. Uh, Scott Stuber's over there now running the film division. Obviously, what Reed and Ted have done is extraordinary. And, and they're really supportive of the artistic community. And everybody I know who's over there working is having a great time. And I think it's bringing the best out of the existing studios. Tom Rothman's doing good stuff down in Sony and Donna Langley over at Universal. So it's just good for everybody when there's healthy competition and schlocky, shitty product isn't really coming out anymore. There's too, there's too much choice. And if something's bad, it's just never going to see the light of day or it's going to become more prohibitive for it to see the light of day. And again, that's good for us as fans because it's a bummer when you go to the movie theater and you shell out your dough and you pay for parking and you do the thing and you're disappointed with the experience. And I think the competition, like it does in any industry, is resulting in a better and better experience for people who love the movies. Uh, I always ask about t the test screening process and the editing process because ultimately that's where every movie is made, in the editing room. Um, what did you learn from any friends and family screenings or test screenings that impacted the finished film? Well, first of all, I completely agree with you. The power, I, I use an example all the time of the power of post-production, which is the fake Shining trailer. Sure. Because you take the existing footage from The Shining and you redo it with some VO and the Peter Gabriel song and all of a sudden it's a romantic comedy. And what could be a more punchy example of the power of post-production where if you were an editor, you could say, look, I'll take that very footage from The Shining, that masterpiece of horror and suspense, and I'll turn it into a romantic comedy. Watch this. And to your point, that speaks to the power of finishing and post-production. So I just wanted it to be a tonal mashup and equal measure a Grindhouse picture and a John Hughes picture. And, uh, you know, homage to my mentor, Quentin, Tar Quentin Tarantino, who started me all those years ago when I was making music videos and commercials at Abandoned Park, the company he had with Lawrence Bender. Sure. So we learned a lot from showing it to friends and family, but I was encouraged to keep it weird. And that's why I'm so proud of this picture, because we didn't placate to the lowest common denominator. We made the film we set out to make, and we made the film that was originally on the page, which was a very, it's a very, very odd, strange film, and I, I love it that way. Well, one of the things is that it seems to me, and I could be wrong about this, but it seems like we're in the middle of a, of a renaissance, if you will, of, of making films that actually feature kids, that are like, you know, or, or about kids that are like 12, 13, 14. Um, so uh, talk a little bit about how the protagonist of this movie is actually a kid. You know what I mean? Well, I always love those movies. I mean, I, I love Stand By Me. I love, uh, of course, It was a masterpiece. Stranger Things is as great as advertised. Can't wait for season two. And I'm sort of emotionally frozen at that age. It was a seminal age for me. So I had a difficult time in junior high school and high school where I was a bit of an oddball. I was really immersed in music and film. And people, I mean, I wasn't bullied so much. I was cool with people, but I was still kind of a loner and an outsider and just an oddball. So I connect with that point of view of the kids in Stranger Things, the kids in It, the kids in Stand By Me, the kid in The Babysitter who's, you know, in one night you sort of go from being a boy to being an adult. And I just, I like when the odds are against you and you got to dig deep and find your hero. It's just sort of a fun story to tell. It's interesting because there's some humor in this that's completely aimed at adults. And uh, some, some, it is a mashup, if you will, of a, a few different things. So uh, did you, was there any resistance at any point of sort of, you know what I mean? Because you're not just- There's always resistance. People always think I'm fucking crazy. You know, I mean, Amy Pascal was on her way down to the set of Charlie's Angels to fire me because she was looking at the dailies going, what, what is this? Am I supposed to be laughing? Am I supposed to be engaged? Is it action? What planet are you on? And to me, that's, that's interesting. I, I like making films where, they, where people can't just put it in a box. And this film is meant to be a tonal mashup of a great many influences, but hopefully, though it is derivative of many things, it's original in the end which is my goal. And I mean, I, I tried to do that with Chuck in a television capacity, the Charlie's Angels movies, with, uh, you know, Lethal Weapon that's on the air right now. And, you know, just about everything that I'm involved in. I, I, I'm just a huge fan. So I like humor and I like suspense and I like romance and I like action and I like emotion. So if I can bring things together and have it feel original in the end, I think Joss Whedon does that really well. I think Favreau does it well. That would certainly be my goal. And, and hopefully we did it with The Babysitter. Uh, I saw a cut. Uh, Netflix sent me a link, so obviously I watched it like that. But I don't know if the cut that I watched had the final songs in it. So what music is actually in the movie, or what song cues? 
Well, I treat music like a character. I always have. And one thing that was exciting about this picture is, you know, we didn't have all the money in the world, but I really wanted to use We Are the Champions, the Queen song, because uh, it sort of seemed to speak to this very, very difficult journey this kid has been on, and he rises up and, and gets it done. And that's a very expensive cue, and everybody's like, oh, you're never going to get it, you're never going to get it. So I just took a shot at writing a letter to the three remaining band members in Queen, uh, Roger, Brian, and John, and told them that this is essentially a movie about bullying, and Freddie Mercury was a big inspiration to me, you know, all through growing up, and I, I thought it might be a movie that they'd be a proud to be a part of. And, you know, they gave us the cue at a very, very reasonable price. So it was just awesome that artists can get behind something like that when called upon. And then there's, you know, an old uh, blues standard, I Just Want to Make Love to You, which is performed by Foghat. And it's this live version of Foghat, and that just reminds me of when I was, you know, seven years old and I was dancing around my sister, you know, my sister's room and just going crazy because I grew up in this house filled with music where my brother was listening to Led Zeppelin on 10 and my sister would be listening to disco and my dad's listening to jazz and that that's that's sort of a fond memory for me. Just always music, always film, always television and just uh, storytelling. I mean, I was pantomiming and acting out all of these different songs when I was a kid and that's what I, I did when I was making music videos and that's essentially what you see in that moment in the film. Uh, Queen is probably my favorite band. Uh, so what really? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting to hear. Same. I can't wait to see that, you know, that Freddie Mercury picture. I mean, I, I, I really, really am passionate about that band. I and spent I, lots of time listening to those records. I still listen to those records on vinyl, and uh, just maybe I, I think I think that the greatest band of all time. I really believe that because they can be so melodic, they can rock so hard. Such a charismatic, interesting front man. You know, the decidedly musical bass player and John Deacon, you got Brian May building his own guitars, you got Roger Taylor singing the high harmonies, I mean, they just don't make them like that anymore, and I don't know anybody who's made music that even remotely sounds like that since, so I'm with you. Yeah, I, I think that a lot of people don't realize that all four could write, all four could sing, all four could just do everything, it sounds like a fucking verse or something, but you get what I mean, like you yeah. understand, it, yeah. they, were, they were operating on a different level. Yeah, I, I really appreciate what they did for those years, and... There were years where they would release two records in one year. I mean, we look at that today and, and artists who, you know, you make a record every four or five years and you reflect on, you know, Led Zeppelin did it too, but I think twice maybe Queen released two albums in one calendar year. Yeah, it doesn't make sense because I don't think people realize the amount of work it takes to make an album, you know, which is the reason why certain time, why certain artists are, they're not like exactly enthusiastic to go back in the studio. Every, you know, they know how much work that is. Right, and oftentimes you see that great first record because you spent your life making it and then you got two weeks to make the second record. And you've been on the road and you're just like, I don't have anything to say. And, and it's interesting, and, and this kind of goes back to budgetary constraints, which is something I find interesting. It's like, so many bands will talk about when they had nothing going for them, they had everything to say. Then you finally get to that point where you have a rehearsal space and you've got roadies and you've got Marshall stacks and everything you need and you have nothing to say and, and your band is no longer relevant and you're no longer urgent. And sometimes I find that that's the way on a film set. Uh, I don't find throwing money at a film has anything to do with the final result. Uh, I always ask about memorable moments from filming. So while making The Babysitter, is there a day or two you will always remember? Maybe it's from one of the days with the blood and guts, I mean, whatever it may be, but is there one that really always stands out? Well, uh, I'm trying to think what's, what's interesting. I mean, I thought a very memorable day was, you know, in, in the film there's a spin the bottle scene where the Bella Thorne character and the Samara Weaving character kiss. And I remember when I was making Charlie's Angels, just as a sign of the times, the girls needed to sneak into, uh, you know, Justin Thoreau's underground lair. And they did it in a bas relief in plaster. And it, to be in the plaster, you needed to be naked to some degree. And it was very sensitive. And I wanted to be respectful and, and make sure everybody felt comfortable. But it was like this big, big deal. And, and, you know, everybody had to sort of check with their agent and do the thing. And, you know, just that level of, of uh, you know, where society was at that time. And then, you know, now I just found like in an Instagram moment, like the comfort and, uh, you know, that the, these two girls experience sort of like doing that in the interest of, of, of the film, just kissing each other in a place where Bella's like, one of the things that defines me as a human being is I'm, I'm pansexual and I don't want to be put in a box and, you know, this is a statement I'm making. And I was just sort of like, wow, what, what, you know, what an interesting moment of progress, you know, in a very tricky time where, you know, you want to make sure people are treated with great respect and equally at all times. 
Yeah, it's definitely a different time than uh, Charlie's Angels is, what, 15 years? Yeah, 15. I was going to say, it's a completely different world. Yeah, as it should be. I mean, the world is making progress, and you know, people are learning all the times, and hopefully we're better for it. But who knows? I mean, I also, you know, I always want to be sure that we are uh, making progress as a human race. North Korea is a little troublesome. <laughs> State of politics is a little troublesome. I'm like, I'm not even opening the door on politics, because yeah. it would just be a domino. That, uh, yeah, it'd be another yeah, long a, interview. Yeah, there's a whole, a few things I'm not opening the door on. Um, right. uh, so, what the hell, what, you were got involved in Supernatural a long time ago. Yeah, we, we, we put the show on the air. Right, so uh, I've spoken to a number of people that uh, have launched shows that have gone on to be very successful, like Supernatural. And are you sort of like, it's like the gift that keeps giving them a little bit um, in terms of a lot of people don't realize when you when you are part of a big successful show, it's like uh, you can put kids through college. Well, maybe I should give you my business manager's <laughs> phone number because I, I'm the wrong guy to ask about back end on anything right. in, in, in Hollywood. So, you know, I, I, again, I, I, I don't really get too hung up on that as far as that stuff kicking in. Maybe one day there'll be some big, you know, wonderful back end participation. But I always find that, you know, whether it was the music business, the film business, or the television business, that that never seems to, to reach my doorstep. So I got to focus on having fun and making sure that, you know, when I get up at four in the morning and get in the back of the van to go shoot, sure. I, I love it for loving its purpose. And now more than ever, as I get a little older and I'm doing my thing, I, mean, I love it more than I've ever loved it. And I think that's what matters most, to be in it for the right reasons. And it's funny because I talk to, to young writers and actors and filmmakers and just with the greatest respect, when I was a kid, you had to really bite, scratch and kick to get Panavision to lend you equipment. You had to hang out at the dock of the Kodak lab to get short ends so you could get some film to try to shoot it. And now, I mean, you look at Zack Snyder, he does beautiful things on an iPhone. Yeah, no, you know, no. you really, really can't do it. So writers write, directors direct, performers perform. It's every opportunity to put what you want out there. I mean, you can take your buddy, uh, you know, a boy and a girl, and throw them in a, a at a coffee table. Uh, he's in love with her. She no longer loves him, and do the scene. It's a master and two singles, and if it's well crafted, I mean, you could bring. Scott Rudin to his knees. And it's just cool that that's available to you as an artist if you choose to do it. I mean, look at some of the great photographs that come out of an iPhone that everybody's a photographer now, and it's, again, it's in the best interest of artistry. Completely. Uh, you have been involved, though, in a lot of television over the last decade or two. Um, you, you mentioned Chuck, Supernatural, Lethal Weapon, there's a, a lot of stuff. Um, how, how typically do you get involved with a television project? Uh, do you, is it like every pilot season people are coming to you saying, what do you think? Like, how, how does it, how, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just curious where it begins for you. Well, it's sort of, I, I don't really, it's funny. I, people talk about the movies or television or making a record or it's development seasons. I mean, I approach everything the same way. I really just try to identify what I think is cool and what I think the audience will react to. And sometimes that's a television show and sometimes that's a song. And sometimes it's a movie, and sometimes that movie costs a lot of money, and sometimes it costs very little money. And I don't really wear a different hat. I just sort of wake up and say, this, this woman has a wonderful voice as a writer. I think that we should talk to her. She's great. This kid is a great actor. Who's this guy Tom Hardy that I've seen in all these British films? We should bring him to America. Just It, it, it never changes. It's just keeping your eyes and ears open and trying to curate what is super cool. So... One of the great things about television is that it happens with great regularity, whereas films take a long time and come together and fall apart. And TV oftentimes is on a schedule which is conducive to getting stuff on the air. And now here we go again, we're trying to put together uh, True Lies, which is exciting because talk about total mashups. I mean, Jim Cameron is known for his prolific drama and epic scale and you know he's probably the most prolific filmmaker of all time. He's got the biggest and second biggest movies ever made. But if you look at that picture, that might be the heavyweight champ of all time as far as mixing tones and coming out the other end in a very satisfying capacity. I mean, True Lies is equal measure farce as it is drama, as it is action-packed thriller, and it all works. And I think that's very interesting and hopefully we'll get it right in, in its uh, television expression. One of the things, I was actually gonna bring this up with you, one of the things that I found as a, as a television fan is that more and more I'm gravitating towards eight, 10, 13 episode shows. Because I feel like I can get in, watch it, get out. And it takes a lot for me to get into a 22 episode show because it's a huge commitment. Can you, and can you sort of talk about what you're thinking about for the future 
in terms of, do you agree with me that the eight to 13 episodes is almost easier? Do you find those, you enjoy those more? I, I agree with you. I think the sweet spot for masterful storytelling is probably eight to 13 episodes. I think you experience atrophy a lot of the time if you're in a place where you gotta make 22, it's hard. And I would imagine, at least the showrunners I've worked with and some of the greats of all time from Josh Schwartz and Stephanie Savage to Matt Miller to Eric Kripke, it's really tough once you get north of that 13, 15, here comes 18, 19, 20. The cast is tired, the crew's tired, the writer's room is tired, and you can do it. I think it's easier to do it in a comedy capacity than in a dramatic capacity, but I agree with you. I think the, the highest quality stuff and the most exciting stuff that's happening now seems to be in 8 to 13 hours. And back to the filmic tie-in, I love The Crown. But I don't know if I would love The Crown, the movie, as much of a Peter Morgan, Stephen Daldry fanatic as I am. I don't know if I'd like the movie as much as I like the series. And for goodness gracious sakes, I'd go see the Game of Thrones movie, but I'm delighted that I get to enjoy Game of Thrones six, seven, you know, 10, 12 hours a season, depending on what they feel like doing, over the course of many, many years. To me, that's the most enjoyable way to ingest that material. So, you know, I, I don't know what The Revenant would be as an eight hour, 10 hour series. It felt perfect to me as a movie, so great. But at sure. the same time, Stranger Things, I think I like that as a series more than I would have liked the f cinematic equivalent. I, I think you're, you're, I'm agreeing with you on a lot of what you're saying. Uh, also, for people that are watching this who have not seen The Crown, it's awesome. I think it's amazing. I think it's, you just can't take it any higher. Yeah. I, people always ask, like, what's your favorite this? What's your favorite that? And for me, it's just, there are just things that I can't like any more than I do. Like, The Crown, I'm maxed out at how much I like it. Game of Thrones, I'm maxed out at how much I like it. Drive, I'm maxed out at how much I like that movie. I mean, it's just sure. like, I can't get into, do you like Drive or Game of Thrones? I mean, it's just, I'm like, I just like those. Uh, Singing in the Rain, I just like it as much as I can like something. <laughs> sure, no. So it's difficult to say I like this one better than that one. There are just certain things that, like, I think of life as a, an old audio VU meter that if you hit it too hard, it sort of pins. The enjoyment factor on those things for me is just maxed out. Yeah, I think it's interesting that we've gotten in a society where everything has to be ranked. So everything has to be, there's so many people that are obsessed with saying, is the crown better than this? Or is Game of Thrones better than this? I'm like, it's just great stuff. Yeah. It's just, you know, and also it's very hard to compare something that has a crazy budget to something like Drive, which was made for like 15 million, which is still amazing. True, but I mean, you know? I look at Ex Machina, I can't imagine an improvement in that film. And they made that film at a price. And if they'd have had all the, and, and listen, I. I don't think the second Charlie's Angels picture was as good as the first one, and I had more time and more money and more toys on the second one than I did the first one, and it was fine, and we did a few things right, but there's something about a, a clarity in an artistic point of view that transcends money. And I also don't look back at The Graduate and say, oh, if they would have had more time and money, I would have liked the movie more. You know, sure. some things are just just perfect the way they are, and, and yeah, I, listen, I love an event movie. I love what J.J. got up to with that last Star Wars picture. My hat is completely off to him. And, you know, I, I, I like the Marvel movies. I like the Pixar movies. I like the DC movies. So I'm, I'm all about having state-of-the-art opportunity to really do something special. But at the same time, I really appreciate stuff that's scrappy and has a very specific point of view. I want to actually get back with True Lies. Uh, is that, that's being made at Fox, or am I wrong? Fox, yeah. Right. So. How do you thread that needle of if they ask you for 22 episodes and something like that, or are you going to try to go to them and be like, this would be a great 13 episode show? Well, I mean, we did it with Lethal Weapon. So it was a similar scenario. I mean, we did uh, 15 last year and we'll do a few more this year, but it was the same conversation. Because but it's still not 22. It, correct. <laughs> because I just, and it's, it's with, with respect, I mean, listen, we get to do these things and make these great shows and these great films because it has to be profitable or it would just go away. So you got to do what's right and be good partners to be at Fox, be at Warner Brothers, be at Viacom, be at Sony. And it's more profitable if you have a show that's working if you make 22 episodes. Uh, but not to the extent where it's worth it to cannibalize the show or the quality of the show or the fundamental uh, story writing or performance on behalf of the cast and crew. So you got to find that sweet spot and that balance. And now, nowadays, you can really have that conversation in regards to, hey, this is where we want to be with the best expression of the show possible. Uh, I believe you guys at Wonderland financed I Feel Pretty. Yeah. Uh, I'm Amy Schumer. You're, you don't have to sell me on her. Uh, yeah, what I love her. I, I, just, I just think Amy Schumer, 
I mean, I know she's a little rough for a lot of people, but I think she's extraordinary. She's just my kind of person. She's extremely intelligent, extraordinarily intelligent. She's talented. She's an activist. She fights for what she believes in, and she keeps it real. So those are all the things I like, and sometimes that's, that's, that's explosive, and it's not for everybody. And I just, I regard Amy Schumer as a tremendously sophisticated, dimensionalized, interesting, wonderful person. And I feel the same way about Chelsea Handler. And I've had the privilege of working and getting to know both of them. And I feel the same way about Reese Witherspoon. I mean, I'm a weird case because I like being kind of a dude's dude, but at the same time, I've done my best work when I've been partnered with women. Uh, be it Charlie's Angels, be it you know Reese Witherspoon, be it Stephanie Savage in the OC. So it's very interesting, I think, that balance. And I think that's what makes creativity fun. Uh, for people that aren't familiar with the project, how do you describe it to friends? Which one? I feel pretty. Well, it's very straightforward. It's it's actually about belief in self, and you know, not to get preachy with it, but we're trying to offset body image problems that I think are so prevalent in today's society. And I mean, I love this model, Ashley Graham, who's out there doing her thing, and you know, being strong. But put simply, Amy's character is trying to get in shape. She falls off a bike, and Soul Cycle hits her head, and thinks she's thin and extraordinary and beautiful in sort of that you know traditional sense. And of course, she hasn't changed, but how she feels about herself has changed tremendously. And then, of course, the world starts to respond to her differently. So the message of the film is be comfortable in your own skin and own it. And that's always best for you, the individual, and strangely, very attractive in the end. So just own what you got. Uh, when is it coming out? I think it comes out June 29th. It's a July 4th picture of next year. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's saying it. We're, we're going in. Yeah, we're going in. We're going in hard on that one. So yeah. that's a different expression. That one feels like, well, all right, maybe this is the one we go all out on and we talk about that, you know, P&A spend, which is a very, very real thing and you want to be intelligent and responsible with it. And I'm the world's worst business person, so I'm the wrong guy to ask about that. <laughs> right. Um, I definitely want to touch on, uh, you were attached, I don't think it's moving forward right now, for Masters of the Universe. Yeah. Um, what exactly, what, what happened? Is it, do you know? I know. I mean, just uh, Goyer's in there writing it. He might direct it. He's awesome. Uh, it just never quite came together at the time where we were circling it down there with you know my dear friend Tom Rothman, and and you know it just it's it's tough. I mean, I would say about half the movies that filmmakers get involved in go, and about half fall apart for any of a number of reasons. I remember I was working on Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. Sure. I loved it. You know, we got the green light from Dick Cook. Dick Cook left and in came Rich Ross and he didn't want to make that movie at that time with what he was trying to do, which is certainly his privilege. And it just takes a great many things to line up. I think I think Steven Spielberg would tell you that. I think anybody would tell you that. He had a hard time getting Schindler's List made. And it's just, like I say, it's witchcraft and it's, it's magical anytime a movie comes together and actually gets made. And I, I stole that line. I mean, I think it was Kathleen Kennedy or Frank Marshall or one of the greats that sort of put that together. So it's true. and. It's heartbreaking when something you love doesn't come together, but I, I, I really think that's the way it goes. I, I've said this to a, a number of people that um, we, on Collider, we will run so many news stories. And I'm like, I try explaining to people, you shouldn't get upset when things are getting announced because nine out of 10 times it's gonna fall apart. Get upset if, you, if it's moving forward and it's completely a problem, or if you see the movie and you're not happy with it, mm -hmm. but you shouldn't be worried about it until it's actually in front of cameras, because so much doesn't move forward. Yeah, I mean, look at True Lies. We're trying and it's healthy and we're feeling good, but who knows? It's got to come together. It's got to be great, and that speaks to the demand and the standard of of the audience. The audience has a great many choices, and you and I were talking about it. There's more great stuff out there than even we can watch. Or, or you'd be at home all day and you'd never get anything done. And even then, you couldn't watch it all. I mean, now I'm, I'm watching The Fall. Caught up on that. I love Black Mirror. I, love, I just There's so much good stuff. And, you know, Atlanta and so many things I want to see. And then there's the foreign language films and everything. And you want to have time to service it all, but it's terribly, terribly difficult. But it's resulting in a higher standard. If it's not great, then it's more likely to fall apart. Well, that, that's the other thing is that it is... It's it's very challenging to break through the noise when everyone is like, oh, that's a good show. Well, that's a good show. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I think one of the... Well, approach it this way. What's a crappy show? Yeah. Well, that's how rare it is. It's like, well, like, oh, big network. Well, you know what? Blackish is really good. I like This Is Us. I like, you know, it's like, 
it, it's I mean, I, there's a lot of people that love this is us. Absolutely. You know? I'm just saying it's not like the easy, you know, low hanging fruit of oh network. I mean, network TV is really good right now. It's super good. Yeah. So. Um, I don't know, and I think that's good for us. I mean, I love what Berlanti's doing with the DC Universe at the CW. I mean, we've been on the CW for a long time with Supernatural. There's good stuff all over the place. Really smart people out there telling great stories, and I do think the competition is bringing out the best in everybody. Uh, I have to ask you, what was your, did you have like a take on Masters of the Universe that you want to possibly share with us? Or was it one of these things where, I mean, what, what were you thinking about? Yeah, I mean, I, I listen, I'm, I love what James Gunn did with Guardians, and I thought that would be an interesting tone and a tone that I can kind of speak to and what Joss did as well. So guys like that are guys after my own heart, and I think that's great for Masters of the Universe. And it was just sort of genesis in regard to what was going on with Skeletor, kind of fun in that regard. And I've always just been a huge fan. I played with the toys when I was a kid. I watched the cartoons and did the whole thing. So who knows? Hopefully the film will get made. and. I don't know. I don't think they're on a very fast track on that just yet, but I, I think Goyer's a tremendous talent and it's in good hands. He's going to write a great script. It's interesting because it's such a popular IP to so many people, and the toys have been popular since we were kids. Yeah. So it's just one of those things where you, you wonder, what's it going to take? You know what I mean? To I, I think they'll get there. You know, I, I think they'll get there, but it's tough and the stakes are high, and who knows? And any 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 head of the studio is under a lot of pressure and they got to make their choices and they try to do a good job and get them right and believe me I, I mean i know tom rothman extraordinarily well and he's a very tough guy but i adore him and he means well and he's a filmmaker's filmmaker he's really an artist at heart and he'll do the right thing ultimately down there at sony uh on the always accurate imdb you are attached or the company's attached to a number of projects uh, what are you excited about for what's coming up? Or what can you tease? Well, we want to finish I Feel Pretty with Amy Schumer well, because it's in post-production right now. Sure. We just finished shooting and you know now we got to, as we talked about the importance of post-production, we got to get that right. So that's a big priority. True Lies is a huge priority for me. And uh, you know, we're just on the eve of releasing The Babysitter, which is, I'm just so thankful and pleased with the way the film came out. It feels like me. And I just, I like, being able to do what I think is best. And for, you know, if, if, if anybody out there doesn't like the picture, you can definitely throw those darts right at me because this really is what I think is the best version of that movie. And I just can't wait to share it with all the fans out there. Uh, so for projects like The Fall Guy or The Magic Castle or things that are like listed with your just name? development. I mean, it's just like you said, you, you've always got to keep the, the fire stoked because I feel pretty wasn't coming together until Shimmer went, I really like this. I want to be a part of this. And you're like, okay, we just went to the top of the charts in regard to the, the reality of getting this film made. So you always keep your toes tapping. We're trying to get a movie made on Shel Silverstein, the great children's author sure. that is going to star and be directed by James Franco. I think he's a stunning artist and does really interesting things. But again, it's always tricky. We're right at that moment of like, is it going to come together? Here we go. And knock on wood, I, I really hope that one comes together because I think he's got an interesting voice. Uh, have you seen The Disaster Artist yet? Of course. I loved that film. Yeah. Like, James did, that. that's his first movie that I've seen by him that I'm like, oh wow. Yeah. This is real good. Yeah. He's, 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 he dances to his own tune and he does his thing and I think you got it right on that one. Oh, without a yeah. doubt. Um, uh, uh, jumping backwards, the last time I might have interviewed you might have been Terminator. It really? Might, it might be like eight, nine years. It's possible. Um, I'm actually being serious because I was researching it and I'm like, I can't believe it's been that long. But I have to ask you, if I remember correctly, there are deleted scenes to that movie that have still never been released. Am I wrong? You are right. There are deleted scenes that have never been released and it's a really, really tricky thing for me to talk about because I like the movie and we did a lot wrong with that movie and maybe there's some of those things, including the deleted scenes that I should have put out there with just a little bit different take and a little different feeling in the end of the film, but I'm extremely proud to have made a Terminator picture that features the incredible Christian Bale as written by Jonah Nolan. And you know, we got our ass kicked and that's my fault. I have to take responsibility for the way I express Jonah's art and the way that I guide Christian Bale in that particular instance. And I liked the film and I thought it was quite good, but it wasn't as great as it could have been. 
And it's, it weighs heavily on me that we never got to a place of making a second and a third picture, which was certainly my intention. But now I'm excited to see what they do with the new ones. And again, it's like Charlie's Angels. Charlie's Angels is in great hands with Liz Banks. In a, in a post Wonder Woman, Patty Jenkins world, someone as smart and as sharp as Elizabeth Banks should be all over that picture. I did my thing. It's time for somebody else to carry the torch. I love Tim Burton, but I'm sure glad Chris Nolan made those Batman pictures too. No, no, totally. And a lot of people, I think, lose or have forgotten that Jonah Nolan was involved. And it's just, it's funny. You know what I mean? It's not that funny to me. Right. I mean, I have a heavy heart because you, you I want... Didn't mean it, I didn't mean it like that. I, I mean, and I, I like the movie. It's imperfect. And, you know, lots of people like to throw stones at me over that one. But I gave it everything I had. And uh, I'm heartbroken that we didn't make a second and a third one. And obviously, I think Christian Bale is, is maybe the most talented actor of our generation. Gosling is immeasurable he's great too of course and there are many of them Tom Hardy um, but who knows you live and you learn and, and don't sign up for Hollywood if you don't have thick skin and you know you don't like getting your ass kicked because you know what kind of an asshole calls himself McG uh, I actually want to ask you a serious question though because there was at the time thoughts about doing a second and third film clearly that's not happening right now um, I'm curious did you ever share like what you were thinking about doing for the future installments or was it one of these things where you guys were sort of like there were ideas in the smoke but nothing had really been figured out? No, we have it completely figured out. It's completely figured out. It's written out. It's, it's on standby but you know I, I failed to deliver the result necessary to warrant a second and third picture. And it got screwed up with, you know, rights and what have you, and, and that's life in Hollywood. But, you know, again, the picture did well. It just didn't do as well as we needed it to do to keep me around. So it breaks my heart, and I take full responsibility for it. And, you know, if, uh, if I could, I'd change a few things about it, but it's oh, life. Yeah, but my question is, as, as a geek, uh, can you share anything you No way. <laughs> no, I can't. You know, but there, there, there's, I mean, listen, there's such rich mythology there, and I know, I feel very confident they're going to get it right in the new, exp I mean, I just think, uh, you know, Ellison's doing it down there at Skydance, I think Jim Cameron's going to be involved in this expression of it, they're going to get it right, it's going to be awesome, and as a fan, I'm excited, and what can I do but keep my toes tapping and try to get Lethal Weapon right, and try to get the babysitter right, and, and keep trying as an artist to do my thing and take chances, and... I think when you take chances, sometimes you're going to fall flat on your face. And I've certainly fell, fallen on my face many times. But uh, I just do my best to try to get up and keep on rocking. My last thing for you. Um, Netflix seems like everyone I've spoken to, and even you've said uh, how much they're a great partner. Is it one of these things after you've worked with them and you've had such a positive experience that you're all of a sudden taking a little bit more meetings with them? Like, hey, this worked pretty good. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I mean, I think I think greatness exists in so many levels. Hulu does great stuff. Oh, and Amazon. Amazon. Amazon does yeah. great stuff. The networks are doing great stuff. I don't know if anybody's doing it as well as Landgraf down at FX. I mean, it's just all over the place. So you just get a piece of material that you're excited about. And I mean, we're excited about an Evil Knievel 10-episode series we're doing at USA. So that's awesome. And who knew that Mr. Robot could exist in that space until it does? And it's just, it's a, it's a great time for creativity because there's a great many ways to get it out there. So it's exciting. Yeah, and you actually just keep on illustrating, uh, we all need more time. I know. That, that's the whole thing. There's so I much know. content. I know, and it's all really good, and it's just, it's super fun. Yeah. Um, sir, thank you for giving me your time. And My pleasure. For the extended... Privately, we'll talk Terminator. Right. <laughs> that happens on that walk in Santa Monica we talked about. Right, exactly. Yeah. Let, let me get stuck.